There's but one person who makes the decision about how, what direction your life goes, and that's you. People influence us, and people around us can lead us sometimes one way or the other, but ultimately, who does the decision rest with? Us. Amen? Good to have everybody here this morning. This is a good crowd. Good to see everybody. Like Matt said, we're going to do a baby dedication here after a while, um, but for, unfortunately for you, you've got to listen to me preach first, all right? Um, I'll tell you what, before I get into this today, uh, Brother Robert Grisham is here this morning, and a lot of you may not know Brother Robert, but um, as I, when I grew up as a kid down at Blackjack, Brother Robert Grisham was a, a great man of God. He still is a great man of God, but he was a great example and a leader in our church, and I remember as a kid, uh, these, these little boys here aged, sitting in the pews back there and listening to Brother Robert uh, preach, and those are... Those are memories uh, that are ingrained in me, and I have the utmost respect for him, and I am what I am largely today, and, and this ministry even um, is, exists today largely because of Brother Robert Grisham and the influence that he had on me um, as I was growing up, as, as a, that one of those men of God that I look to and follow their example. So I would like for Brother Robert to stand and testify this morning, if you would, please. Let's hear a little bit from you, Brother Robert. That's all right. Amen. You know, you, you get to know people after a while, and something just told me that was coming. I don't know. But, um, but you see what I mean. That, that guy is a rock, and I appreciate him with all of my heart. And you don't have to, you don't have to yank his chain too awful much to get him, get him preaching because the love of the Lord is in him. And, you know, I was thinking back when, when God first, you know, I grew up in Black Jack. Black Jack's where I got saved. It's where uh, I first answered the call to ministry. Um, and, uh, you know, grew a lot there and, and learned a lot there. But I began to feel God pulling me away from there. And that's not an easy thing to leave a church that you grew up in, right? But I began to feel like God was calling me to the town that I lived in and to work here uh, for the kingdom of God. And that was kind of a hard move to make. And, and I was a little timid about it when I went to, uh, to uh, church and was going to make the announcement that I was coming to be the, uh, the youth pastor here at the Assembly of God. And um, I told Brother Rise, a little nervous. I didn't know how everybody would receive that. And of course, you get some people, you know, are encouraging. Some people aren't. But, uh, but Brother Robert, I told Brother Robert about it. And he goes, well, praise God. I mean, he was, you know, excited. Yes, go. And uh, it was such an encouragement to me. And so anyway, I, I love you, Brother Robert and Sister Dorothy. And uh, they've they got a couple grandbabies going to be dedicated here uh, this morning after a while, too. So we're glad to have their family. It's an honor for me to get to pastor their granddaughter and, and all of their and husband and all their kids and stuff, too. So. That being said, let's get into it this morning. If you want to open your Bible to the book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 1. Um, really, all of this this morning kind of 
kind of tees me up just a little bit, kind of sets the stage for uh, the message, really. You know, uh, Brother Robert uh, talking about him being a, a staple, being a, a dedicated man of God for so many years, and, and Brother uh, Brother Papaw, you guys know him as Glenn, we know him as Papaw, um, testifying this morning, uh, these, are, these are two men that, that didn't just decide to start going to church 50 years ago or however many years ago, 60 years ago, uh, but decided to dedicate their life to God. And that's, that's what I want to talk about this morning is dedication uh, and what that really means. And so in Romans chapter 12 verse 1, uh, I think I'll actually read verse 1 and 2. Tricked you, Jennifer. I don't think I gave you tw uh, verse 2. But uh, Romans 12 and 1 starts off like this. I, be I appeal to you, the King James says, I beseech you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. I like the way the King James says, it is your reasonable service. God's not asking anything from us that is unreasonable. Can we make that clear this morning? Amen. We may feel sometimes like what God is asking of us is unreasonable, but it is not. Uh, I beseech you by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Let's pray to the, together this morning. Father, as we prayed earlier, we so pray again, Lord, as we turn to the pages of your word. We recognize this morning the power that is in it. We recognize this morning the life that is in it and the light that it gives us in our life. And I pray this morning that you would anoint me with the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would speak your words through me, God, that I might handle your word correctly, and that this word today might penetrate. God, that we would find that, that, that extra oomph, Lord, that we might find that extra passion uh, by which to serve you, that we never find ourselves getting into a lull or into a rut uh, and going through the motions, but God, that we might dedicate our lives to you fully and completely, uh, holding nothing back, that, that we too, Lord, might be able to uh, bear the testimony as, as Brother Glenn and Brother Robert have, have um, shared with us, Lord, that so many years of serving you, being dedicated to your service, and you have proven yourself to be faithful Lord, you're not asking anything unreasonable of us. Help us, God, not to be selfish, but to be yielding to you and to your will. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Everybody give me a big shout of amen. 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 All right. So, I beseech you, Lord, or brothers, Paul is writing to Christian people, that you present yourself a living sacrifice. Not, we've talked in, in, on Wednesday nights for the past several months or weeks, we've talked in Hebrews, we've talked about the, the literal sacrifices that they would make in the Old Testament, bringing the lambs and, and killing the lambs. And God said, that's not really what I'm after. I'm looking for people who are a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto me. And God says, it's, it's your reasonable service. And so when God looks for dedication from us, first of all, I want to I talk about what dedication means. I looked, if you look into the Webster Dictionary, dedication basically means this. This is the definition. To be committed and devoted to a particular task or purpose. Okay? To be committed. How many of you, how many of you know there's, there's a difference in doing something and doing something? Right? But to be fully and completely committed and devoted to a particular task or purpose, or you might say person, um, is to be dedicated to it. So the difference, there's a difference in being dedicated to something, to being committed to something, and just kind of contributing to something, participating in something. You can participate in something, but not be committed to it, right? So let me, let me give you this example. Some of you may have, have heard this before, but it was a reality for us last night at our house. Uh, sweetie cooked a fantastic meal. How many of you ever eat breakfast for supper? Oh, yeah. We do that all the time. We, I like, I'd almost rather eat it for supper than I would for breakfast. But, uh, so, so Sweetie cooked up a great big ham steak and, and fried up a bunch of eggs and made up some biscuits. I know this is, I'm, I'm getting on dangerous ground when you talk about food, you know, on Sunday morning service. Uh, I'll lose your attention. But biscuits and we had homemade jelly that Gloria had made. So anyway, we ate this meal and so when I, I sit there and I look at this plate with the ham and the eggs, what, come, what becomes very clear as I look at this is that the chicken contributed to the meal, but the pig was fully committed to the meal. <laughs> See the difference? Right? I think you're getting it. <laughs> right? 
So, so what God is looking for from us is for us not to just contribute to his work, not just to contribute a little bit of our lives and a little bit of ourselves to his service, but to make the same kind of commitment the pig made. Jesus literally said this. Let me quote Jesus Christ. He said, if a person is not willing to take up their cross and follow me, they have no part in me, right? He said, I'm looking for people who make a living sacrifice. When something is sacrificed, it dies, right? And so that living sacrifice in which the old man, the old Dennis, and his goals and his pursuits goes by the wayside, it dies, and I become alive as a new creature in Christ Jesus, right? So this morning, if you want to, you can turn there if you want to. If you don't, I'm, I'm going to hit it really quick. But in, in Psalm chapter number 40, David says it something like this. Uh, chapter 40, verse 6. In sacrifice and offering... You have not delighted. This is David basically speaking to God. In, in sacrifices and offerings you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me. I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. There was another place where David wrote it something like this. Lord, if it was really sacrifices and burnt offerings that you were looking for, then I would give them. I will do whatever. But he said, ultimately, it's not the sacrifice of my hands that you're looking for. It is the dedication of my heart that you're looking for. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's me going to the core of who I am and saying, God, I devote my life to you. My, my desire is to do your will. Now, every human being and every Christian, I believe, and myself included, sometimes we struggle with that. Can you honestly admit this morning that there's times you struggle with letting God's will override your will? So God's saying, the sacrifices are great. I appreciate what you do, but that's ultimately in the big scheme of things, not what I'm looking for, not looking for your contributions here and there. I'm looking for total commitment, total dedication to me, God says. So let me kind of make it into real life terms for us. We don't have to offer any kind of blood sacrifices. You don't bring your lambs to me and sacrifice them like they did in the Old Testament. But there are different sacrifices we make as, as Christians in this day and time. You're making one right now. You're making a sacrifice to God right now as we speak. How's that? By being here. Right? This is the last weekend of deer season. <laughs> All right? everybody in this room has got a laundry list of to-do things at your house, do you not? There are a lot of things you could be doing right now, but you sacrifice the time doing that to come and be here in the presence of God because it's important to you, okay? And that's, that's a good thing. But here's, what, here's where I want to challenge you. It's good, I'm glad that you're here. But a, con, a, a contribution is a once a week appearance before God. Dedication, it's a daily appearance before God. Does that make sense? Yes. There are 168 hours in a week. And we can give them two, maybe an hour and a half on Sunday morning. Hey, that's great. And God says, hey, I appreciate your sacrifice. But more than just your sacrifice on Sunday morning, I'm really looking for your heart Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, in which every day you come before me. It's not too awful hard. We talk about the sacrifice, but, but we can muster up enough time to come to church on Sunday morning and make that sacrifice. What we find, let me, let me put it this way. You guys may not struggle with this, but for me, what I find is that my, I'm, I'm willing to sacrifice for the most part so far, right? Sacrifice a little, it doesn't sting. But how many of you know true sacrifice stings a little. Jesus gave a full sacrifice for us. And the pain he felt and endured at the cross and at the whipping post, it cost him something. And so we can finally, especially in, in our busy world and in America where, we, where it's kind of spoiled, is that sometimes we can, we can find that little bit and we'll sacrifice a little bit. God's saying, that's good and I appreciate that and I'm not knocking that. But how about you? every day you appear before me? In which every day you bring your life and you lay it on the altar and say, God, what is your will for my life? And then being willing to listen and follow when God gives us that kind of direction. A contribution 
says, I'll work for the Lord as it fits in my schedule. But a commitment, a dedication to God says, God, here I am, and I'll do whatever you want me to do, and I'll change my schedule if I have to, right? And so I hope this is a challenge. I'm not pointing any fingers or throwing stones. I'm, I'm preaching to Dennis this morning, and then you guys are just listening, okay? For me, I find that sometimes it's easy to sacrifice whenever it's not, it doesn't cost me much. But to have that heart where God is drawing me. See, what happens is when, when you have a, a thought in your mind, you're busy about doing something, and you have this feeling, I need to spend some time before God. That's God drawing you, right? It's God saying, I want you to come before me and present your, yourself before me. Now, we feel a lot of times when the devil comes and, and speaks into our heart and, and basically says that as, as we sacrifice for God, we're losing. We are giving up. Right? But what we find is that the more we dedicate ourselves to God, the more God adds to our life. That, that is just true. That's, that's the way God works. The more we dedicate of our life to God, the more God adds to our life. It's a blessing to sacrifice and to dedicate our, our life and our time unto God. It is a huge, but don't, don't believe the lie that, that God is somehow robbing you. It's a blessing. It's a good thing. I would venture to say that few Christians have ever really dedicated everything to Christ. Now, you may be the exception to the rule, and my goodness, God bless you if you are. But I look at my own, my own life, and can I say I've, I've sacrificed and I've dedicated everything of my life to God? Now, I could stand up here this morning, and I could give you a big, long list of the things that that I've sacrificed and the things that I've done, and I might be able to impress you. Well, I've given up this. I've, I've given up my job. I did this and this and that. All for the work of God, and I can make a big, long list of things. But e- even despite all of those things, I can't in my mind in good conscience sit down and look God in the eye and say, Lord, I have dedicated everything to you. I can't do that. Can you? I hope you can, but I can't. I, and I find myself at times holding back, I, I, holding back on things and clinging to things. Not, and I'm not talking about sinful things. I'm just, I'm just talking about sometimes, sometimes it's the time maybe that God wants me to contribute to a certain work he's wanting me to do. Maybe it's, uh, and maybe I don't do it because I'm afraid of what people might think of me, or, or I just don't want to give the time to do it, or I'm thinking, I'm, I'm already battling, battling hell on every, on every, I don't want to have to battle hell anymore, or even worse, maybe I, my, I have a little bit of unbelief, maybe, maybe I'm doubting, I'm not trusting and having enough faith in God, whatever be the case, but I find myself clinging to things and not fully being able to jump into the deep end. You know, when someone's learning to swim, it's easy to get into the ankle-deep water. Anybody can swim in ankle-deep water. But it's, it takes something more to dive in headfirst into the deep end, right? And so God is so patient with us. And, you know, you're, everybody in here, you may be in different depths. You know, because he eases us in. Man, there's been a lot of... Here, here's where the fun is. I never had any fun in the kiddie pool, Right? That's no fun. You sit there and just splash on yourself. The fun is out in the deep end where the diving board's at, right? That's the way it is in our commitment to God. God says, hey, I'll bless you a little bit if you want to dabble in a little bit. But if you really want to be blessed, if you really want to see me work in your life, I need a full commitment from you. How many, how many of you married people would have been satisfied if on the day of your wedding, you stand up here before God and the preacher and all of the people and and you're giving the vows, and your spouse said to you, I will stand by you for richer, well, richer. I will stand by you in, in, in health, <laughs> as long as you're healthy. If, if the person would have stand across, and they're making a vow to you, and they would have said, look, I, I commit part of my heart to you. I, I, I commit part of my life to you, but there's certain things that I'm just going to do on my own. I don't think anybody would have been satisfied with that. Would you? You look for a full commitment. Sickness and in health. Richer and poorer. Till death do you part. That's a commitment. People find that hard to do. In marriage, in the work of God, and sometimes in children, and in our jobs. I mean, sometimes commitment can seem so scary. Because the thing about commitment is it requires a commitment, right? Right? It requires time, and, and we hold that back. And I, I, Brother, uh, 
uh, Bob Minicky. Those of you that had the pr- privilege of knowing Brother Bob Minicky, he was a, Bob was a great man, simple man, and, and just down to earth and always had a very elegant way of putting things. And, and he told me one time, he just got honest before me, he said, Dennis, he said, there's not a sin in my past that don't have claw marks on it. You know what I mean? The idea that God was trying to deliver him and, and you know, and, and to, he's, everything that God tried to pull him away from, he just hung on to it and he clawed it and, and, and just couldn't find himself to let go. And, and all of us at times struggle with that. Have we, have we ever, any of us, ever come to a point of full and complete dedication to Jesus Christ? So let me give you two examples we find from Scripture. Um, the difference, I guess, between contribution and, and, and commitment. Jesus, at one time, he stood over by, they went to the, to the temple, him and his disciples, and they stood over by the offering plates. They had the offering coffers set out there, and as people walked by, they, they threw their offerings in. And for some people, that was a big show time. They would come up there in their fancy dress and, and it was just, they wanted everybody to see how much money they were throwing into the offering plate. You know, some guys would come up, they're wealthy guys, and they might be throwing thousands of dollars in the offering plate. And everybody would clap, oh, what a great holy person you are that you give so much unto God. What a sacrifice. And everybody gives them glory. And as they sat there, this one little widow lady, this one little widow lady, all hunched over, comes walking up there. She's got on beggar, no doubt a beggar's cloak. She has nothing. She walks up and she throws in, the Bible says, just a couple mites, which you look at that, it's just pennies. I mean, just very, very little money. And she throws it in the offering plate. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, that woman gave more than anybody. Now, from the natural standpoint, that doesn't make any sense. But I, the disciples, I could see them look and say, I just watched that guy throw ten thousand dollars in the offering plate she threw in pennies and you're saying that she gave more that doesn't make any sense he said the reason why she gave more was because she gave all she had she gave it all these guys still had thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars yeah it was a big amount of money but compared to what they had and compared to it was all for show and they he said they, God literally didn't even recognize their sacrifice. Why? Because it's not just sacrifice God's looking for. It's the condition and the commitment and the dedication of our heart. Her offering meant more to him because she gave everything. This is not a, this is not a sermon about, you know, offering giving. This applies to every area of our life. God looks and he sees that the sacrifice stings a little, that we're giving, we're holding absolutely nothing back from God. God, I give you my entire life. That is not an easy thing to say. And, and honestly, I think it would be better not to say that until we're willing to, I mean, I think God would rather us come and say, God, I'm willing to give you three quarters of my life, but I want to be able to give you all of my life. Help me learn to, t- to turn loose of some stuff that, that holds me. Help me to be like that wit- little widow lady who goes up and she's got to eat. She's got to pay bills. She has nothing. She don't know where, what, what's going to happen. After. All she knows is God is faithful. All she knows is that there's nothing she can give that God will, and she, she just casts it all in. I pray God bring me to a place, bring you to a place where we can just say, God, I bring you everything. I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in, no matter what it costs me. There's a, a couple, this is, let me give you the other side of the spectrum. There's a couple we read about in the scripture, <clears throat> somewhere along the lines of Acts 4, I think, somewhere around it through there. This couple is a husband and wife. Their name was Ananias and Sapphira. And during this period of time, uh, the church was really growing, the church world. Jesus had gone back to, the, to, to heaven, and, and the disciples were preaching, and people were getting saved by the droves. I mean, thousands of people getting saved. And, and so the church is, is growing. And so what people were doing in this particular time in order to get the church off the ground is a lot of people were, were selling everything that they had and, uh, and taking it to the disciples. And I know some of you are sitting there thinking, oh, here we go. I knew this was going to. No, this is not the message, okay? I'm not saying sell all you have and bring it to me. The money is not the point, so don't, don't get a sidetracked here. People were selling everything that they had, and they were bringing it to the disciples, and they were, they were devoting their life completely and fully to preaching the gospel and leading people to Christ, okay? And so then they were, you know, as people had need, they, they divided it all up. That's how they did it in that particular time. So this husband and wife, Ananias and Sapphira, had a bunch of property, and they sold the property, and then they brought some of the money 
the disciples. Now, it doesn't give us an idea of what the dollar amount is, but I'm just going to make up a dollar amount so that I can get this point across. So let's say that Ananias and Sapphira, sell, they, they sold their property for $50,000. And so they come to, to, the, to Peter and the disciples, and they said, we sold our property for $40,000, and here it is. And they give them $40,000. And so what we find later on as we go through the story is that they, they had actually sold it for 50, but they only gave 40. But they said they gave 50. They said and they pretended as though they had given everything, but they really had held back a part for themselves. No doubt one of the reasons they held back part was because what if this Christian thing don't work out? What if this church thing, we don't know what their reasoning was. I'm just thinking as a human being, this is probably what they were thinking. Just in case this whole thing don't work out, in case we really can't trust Jesus Christ, let's keep a little back for ourselves. We have something to fall back on. Okay? And that may seem like, make perfect sense. I don't think, personally, this is just Dennis speaking. Okay? This is my opinion. In my opinion, I think if they would have come and said, look, we sold our property for $50,000, we are giving you forty of it, been all good. I think it would have been fine. But they said they gave everything, and they really didn't. And Peter, I get this. Okay, I'm not saying this is going to happen to you, but hey, Peter, this is New Testament we're talking about. And, and Peter looks at Ananias, the husband. Sapphira was out. She was at Walmart getting groceries. And, so, and Ananias was there by himself, and Peter looks to Ananias, because the Holy Spirit revealed to Peter he lied to you. He, he didn't give you everything. And so Peter goes to Ananias and says, Ananias, Ananias, how much, now how much did you say you sold it for? 40000 You gave us 40000 You You sold it. You gave us everything. Yep, sure did. And Peter said, why have you, now look at this, because I think we've all come close to, we don't, he looked at him and said, why have you decided in your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? Okay, here's the big thing. You can lie to me, you can lie to your spouse, you can lie to people, and, and we'll buy it. But we can't lie to God. He said, you have lied, not to me, Peter said, you have lied to God. And in that moment, Ananias just went, Poof. he just fell over dead. Right there, you read about it. I'm not making this up. Acts chapter four. I think it's four. Four, five, three, somewhere around through there. Poof. Falls over dead on the floor. So, the church people, deacons, I guess, or whatever, I don't know. Yeah. Matt, Jeff, Dale, you guys might want to get ready. I don't know what's going to happen here today, but uh, you didn't bring a shovel. So nobody lie to God, please. We are not prepared to bury anybody. They picked his body up, they carried him out, and they buried him. And so a little bit later, of course, you know, and the wife, Sapphira, she didn't know any of this was going on. So she gets back from Walmart, and she goes in to talk to Peter, and Peter goes and says to her, and he said, did you guys really sell that property for $40,000? Yep, sure did, $40,000. And he said, the same guys that buried your husband are going to bury you. She falls over dead in the floor. And he, say, he reiterated, you've not lied to me, you lied to God. Again, the, it, the point of this, it's not about the money. I don't even think it's about the fact that they didn't give all the money. It's about the fact that they said they gave all the money and held a part back. So what does that mean for me? Is that I want to be able to be honest with God, that God wants me to give everything to him. My entire life. My worldview. You know how many Christians there are that struggle with a, with a Christian worldview? How do we look at politics? How do we look at every aspect of life should be through the eyes of the gospel, should be the, through the eyes of Jesus. And sometimes we are so surrounded and influenced by the world around us that sometimes we struggle with that and it's hard to go against the grain. And God said, but I want you to give me all of you and to pretend like we're devoting all. And there's probably, I mean, I, honestly, I don't think there's anybody here that's just pretending like, oh yeah, I'm perfect, I've given God everything and holding it back. I'm just saying that let's take a good inventory of our own heart and our own commitment level. What is your commitment level to Jesus Christ? Nobody can answer that but you. I might, I might look at you and I might say, I might say, Matt, gosh, you could really do better. Man, you need to step up your game. You, you need to be more committed to Jesus Christ. And he may be doing way more for Jesus than I am. 
He's probably doing it in secret like the Bible teaches us to do. It's not about impressing me. It's not about turning it on to me. It's, it's about looking at our own commitment level and determining, can I do more? Can I give Jesus a little bit more of me? You can't, you can't ever give Jesus too much of you. Let me, let me ask you a question. Just think about this. I'm not, saying, I'm not asking this um, uh, to, to breed fear or put, any, or put us under a guilt trip. That's, that's not my intention. I just, want you, I just want you to think about it for just a second because this is real life. So you look at your, your faith in, in Christ and your, your walk as a Christian. Let me ask you this question. Could you die for Jesus Christ? And I, I know a lot of us, we could never really answer that question fully unless we're, until we're put in that particular situation. Okay, and for us, that seems like such a far-fetched idea. Die for Jesus. Why would you even ask me that? I'm, that's never going to happen. Here, here's the thing. And the reason why I ask this is because for the first 300 years of Christianity, after Jesus died on the cross, we read through the book of Acts. There's a lot of people that died for Jesus. Jesus had told his disciples, he said, if you lose your life for my sake, you will gain it. But if you save your life, then you will lose it. Ultimately, what he's saying is, if you aren't willing to die, if you deny me in order, in order to save your neck, then you have no part in me. Jesus literally calls his followers to be willing to die for him if necessary. That's not an easy thing for me to say to you this morning. See, in our world, in America, it would be a whole lot easier for me to just to say, hey, oh, they already took the offering plate. It would, it would be easier for me to say, here, just put, put your money in here and all's good, right? If you'll give, if you'll give me $1,000, God will cancel your debt. And it'd be easier for me to say, hey, hey, g peace, peace. You don't have to worry about a thing. God's got your back. You don't have to worry about ever going through any kind of trials like that. It'd be easier for me to say that to you, and it would be a lie. Because from the beginning of the gospel, there have been times where people have been called upon to give their life. Time and time again, for the first 300 years, Christians were persecuted and they died, not because they committed heinous crimes against mankind, but because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Oh, well, Dennis, that, just, that doesn't happen anymore. That was, three, that was, you know, that was 2,000 years ago. It doesn't happen anymore. Do you know that there are over 200,000 people worldwide, approximately, that number's probably higher now, but uh, a couple years ago, it was like 200 and some odd thousand people annually in the world die because of their faith in Jesus Christ. Not, not in America so much. I, I, get a, I get a magazine, it's called Voice of the Martyrs, and it, and it tells about people in remote countries, Muslim countries, and different countries where they're very hostile towards the gospel. And for somebody to become a Christian and be a follower of Jesus Christ is literally a death sentence, and they're putting their life and their family's lives in danger. And that there's times I've read stories in there where pastors the authorities would come into a church and drag the pastor away and beat him mercilessly and many, many times kill the pastor to show an example to all these people. Don't you follow this Jesus? Re recant, turn against Jesus, deny Jesus. There's times where they've burned people's houses down. They've taken their children and been mean to their children. And these people continue to devote their life to Jesus Christ. Fathom that. Think about that. Again, I'm, it's, not, it's not a fear tactic. I'm just saying I, I think that it's a good idea for all of us to take a good, honest look at our commitment level. I hope and pray that none of us, and in this country, will ever face a time where we have to decide to give our life for Jesus. I hope I don't ever have to know whether I can do it or not. But my prayer, and I don't think our whole life should be built up towards being ready to die if we have to. I just think that if, if every day of my life I have devoted and committed and dedicated my life to Jesus fully, then he's going to give me the strength to do whatever I've got to do. I don't have to worry about it. I don't have to worry about whether you know, my bills are going to be paid or whether I'm going to have food or whether I'm going to have to give my life. I don't have to worry about anything as long as I'm fully committed and, and dedicated to Jesus. That's what he's looking for. Jesus said it like this, probably one of the most quoted verses in the Bible. And I'm going to quote it to you again. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. 
What are all these things? If you read the verses before it, he's talking about food, shelter, clothing, the basic necessities of life, protection, the basic necessities of life. Those things will be added unto you if you are seeking me first, if you are dedicated to me, committed and devoted to a particular task, purpose, or person. If you're fully committed, God says, I have got your back whether you live or whether you die. See, here's the thing. I could, I could deny Jesus to save my neck so I can get what? I mean, I'm 43 years old. Let's say I live to be 80. So I could deny Jesus to gain myself another 37 years. I do the math right. <laughs> to gain, my, gain myself another 37 years of living and then I'm going to die of natural causes? You know what I mean? It's like, we have to look at it from spiritualize and I, so I'm hoping this morning this is my whole purpose in this I, I may feel you make you feel a little un, if I got you feeling just a little bit uncomfortable I've done my job okay that's all I'm wanting to really do because I'm stirred this has kind of just stirred me and so I hope it stirs you just take a look at my dedication level and thank God I, I don't want to just go through the motions here I want to make sure that I am drawing closer to you every day no not a person in this room is going to be perfect not a person in this room is going to get it right every time. There's going to be times where we deny Jesus, just like Peter did, but God will bring us through this if we're dedicated to him. Amen? Amen. So are we fair-weather Christians? Are we stormy-weather Christians? Let me explain what I mean by that. A fair-weather Christian is someone who just serves God when everything in his life is good, right? Some people are like that. As long as everything's good in life, I'll go to church. And then when things get bad... Oh, God just failed me. This, is, this isn't working. And, and then they bail on God. They're fair weather Christians. And then there's stormy weather Christians where when everything's good in our life, their life, they don't serve God. They do their own thing and they only come to God when everything gets bad. When my life falls apart, then I'm going to go to God and I'm going to ask him to fix it. But when everything's good, I kind of forget about God. Stormy weather Christian. But God's looking for all weather Christians, Right? He's looking for people who will serve him and trust him and honor him when things are great and when things are horrible. Paul said, I've learned in whatever state I'm in to be content. He wasn't talking about Missouri and Arkansas and, you know, that kind of state. Whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content. And he goes on to say, if I've got a lot of food, I'm going to be content. If I don't have very much food, I'm going to be, be content. If I've got clothes, Warm clothes, I'm going to be content. If I don't have any warm clothes, I'll be content. Whatever state I'm in, whatever place I find myself, I'm going to trust God, and I know he'll be faithful. And he was. If you look into, you don't, and you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. I always say that. You can turn there if you want to. You do whatever you want. Uh, but in 1 Kings chapter 8, we, we find where God had given Solomon a task important task to, to build the temple. And, it was a, and I'm not going to go into the whole thing, but I mean, it was, it was a big undertaking. They had to gather materials from all the people of Israel. They had to have workers and laborers and, you know, stonemasons and carpenters. And they went through all of this stuff and they built the temple just exactly the way God told them to build it, okay? And so once the temple was all built, Solomon gathered all of Israel together to dedicate the temple to God, to take all of their efforts, all of their work, all of their labor, all of their sacrifice and their giving because the, all the stuff that come together to build the temple came from the people. And so they bring all of the sacrifices of the people and they build this temple and they dedicate this temple unto God. And this is kind of what the scene looks like. This is in uh, 1 Kings chapter 8, down around along verse 10. When the priest came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud for the glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Okay, so when, when Solomon brings it together and he says, Lord, this building is yours. Okay, it's not my building. It's not, it's not ours. It's not our material. This is your building. Do with it as you please. Do with it as you want. And you know what God did? He filled it. I mean, imagine, this was, a, this was a visible manifestation of the glory of God. They literally watched the glory of God come down and fill this temple. And God says, I'm putting my stamp of approval on it. I'm gonna, everything that's done in this temple is going to be anointed. 
Because they had dedicated it unto God. Nobody held any reserve. Well, we want the church to be run this way. We want the temple to, temple to be run this way. They said, it's yours, God. Do what you want. And he filled it. And, and the Bible teaches us that we now, Paul said, don't you know that, that you, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Ghost? We are the temple. We're the place where God wants to live. And all God's looking for is a person that will look to him and say, God, here I am. I'm yours. And that, the last that verse, Paul says, you're the temple of God. You are not your own. You're bought with a price. You don't belong to you. That's how we live, as though we belong to us. Well, I'm a man of my own house. I'm a man, I'm the king of my, and we live like we own ourselves, like we created ourselves. God said, you don't belong to you. You belong to me. So when that, that Holy Ghost, that, that temple, that man, that woman, that boy and that girl that looks at God and says, God, I dedicate my life to you. The Robert Grishams, the Glens of the world, I, I, I dedicate my life to you. And here's what God says I'm going to do. I'm going to fill you with my presence. I'm going to fill you with my spirit. And you will be anointed to do what normal man could never do. I'm speaking to you today, and, and as you hear and the, and the Lord begins to deal with your heart, I cannot do that. I cannot convict you. I cannot convince you. It is a work of the Spirit that comes on the inside and does miraculous things in the life of the person who has dedicated themselves unto God. Solomon, it's, it's amazing. I'm not, I'm not going to read I'm out of time, but Solomon, when you're going through this and you read this, Solomon, when he begins his prayer of dedication to God, Okay, he's just watched the fire of God fall and fill this place. And Solomon, the Bible says he lifts his hands. You get the picture of him. He lifts his hands and he begins to pray unto God. God, we ask you to do this and God help us to do that. And it's a beautiful prayer. You can read about it in 1 First, Kings chapter 8. It's a beautiful prayer that, that Solomon prays. He's standing, this is key. At the beginning, he's standing with his arms stretched. But at the end of that prayer, the Bible says he rose up from his knees and his hand stretched. What does that tell me? Here's what I gather from this picture, is he begins to pray and begins to dedicate, not only the temple, the building, but he begins to, begins to dedicate himself to God. He says, God, I'm just, a, I'm, a, I'm just a man. I don't know how to lead these people. I need your help. Help me to know what you want me to do. He didn't want money. He didn't want victory. He didn't want fame. He just wanted to know what God wanted him to do. He just wanted to know how to lead the people the way God wanted him to lead it. And so he's, he's praying. He's dedicating not only the temple, but he's, he's dedicating himself to God. He's standing. And at some point in time through that prayer, it became so meaningful to him. It became so powerful that he drops to his knees and his hands before God. And he's pleading to God, God, I dedicate myself to you. And I know you'll be faithful. Wow, what an amazing thing. And God just opened the windows <clears throat> and poured an anointing out on that guy. We find a, the Bible says that Solomon, nobody had more wisdom. No human being that has ever lived had more wisdom than Solomon did. Amen? <clears throat> because he was dedicated, not just contributing, <clears throat> but fully dedicated and committed to what God had called him to do. So let me just kind of bring it to this. I'm going I'm to bring us in for a landing and kind of set the stage here for the next part of our service. <clears throat> Every one of us this morning make individual decisions every day. The greatest decision we'll ever make is the one to, de de to dedicate our life to the Lord. I love it when people come to church. I really do. <clears throat> I love to see the house full. People walk through those doors on Sunday morning. But you know what blesses my heart even more? When you all come to me with testimonies of what God has done for you on a Thursday evening at 7.49 p.m. I was reading the scriptures and this is what God showed me. To watch you grow, amen? Watch you grow in the spirit and become more yielded and dedicated to God. For people to step up and say, God's dealing with me to, to do this, to work in this area of the church, whatever, I'm wanting to commit to God. <clears throat> 